Thank you, Sergeant. Good afternoon. I am Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. This is a hearing on the fiscal 2019 executive budget for the Department of Sanitation held jointly with Committee on Finance. Today, we will hear testimony from the Department of Sanitation about its $1.73 billion fiscal 2019 expense budget and $2.2 billion fiscal 2018 to 2022 capital commitment plan and general agency operations. The committee looks forward to hearing about such important topics, um, such as efforts to bolster zero waste outreach, uh, future plans for a cleaner fleet, and identified new services as well as updates on current service levels. Uh, I wanna just uh, thank uh, the director, Latanya McKinney, Deputy Director Regina Ryan, and Nathan Toth, um, committee councils, Rebecca Chasen and Nicole Benny, um, unit heads, Krillian Francisco, financial analyst, John Seltzer, uh, the finance division, administrative support unit, again, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Roberta Caruano, uh, who pull everything together. I really wanna thank um, the staff behind the scenes that do all this work and make us look, look competent. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 24th, beginning at approximately 4 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division um, at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of their official record. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I would also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members uh, Fernando Cabrera and Keith Powers, um, and now I will pass it over uh, to hear testimony from uh, Commissioner of the Department of Sanitation, D. Catherine Garcia. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Renoso. Uh, we're just gonna swear you in oh, very quickly. Sure. Yes. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Absolutely, yes. Good morning, Chair Renoso and members of the City Council Committees on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and Finance. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. I am joined by Stephen Costas, First Deputy Commissioner, and Larry Cipollina, Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Financial Management. We appreciate this opportunity to testify on the department's expense and capital portions of the mayor's fiscal year 2019 executive budget. The fiscal 2019 executive budget allocates $1.73 billion in expense funds to the department, of which $1.01 billion is for personal services and $724 million is for other than personal services. Our budgeted headcount for the fiscal year 2019 executive budget is 10,306 full-time and full-time equivalent positions. The funding made available to the department by this budget will allow us to meet our core service obligations to the public by keeping New York City healthy, safe, and clean. This budget includes funding for a new initiative called Clean NYC 2.0. This program includes targeted cleaning resources, including mobile litter patrol, litter basket service, and mechanical broom service in the Brooklyn North Zone, which has the lowest average scorecard rating of the seven zones in the city and four districts in the zone rank among the 10 districts with the lowest scorecard rating in this fiscal year to date. Clean NYC 2.0 also includes additional supervisory resources to monitor compliance with alternate side parking regulations and ensure that mechanical brooms are able to quickly and effectively clean their routes. This expands on the earlier version of Clean NYC, which provided highway on-ramp cleaning and expanded Sunday and holiday litter basket service in all five boroughs. On the topic of cleaning, I am excited to share with the council that this summer, the department will be launching a design competition to envision the next generation corner litter basket for New York City. We expect to release more information about this exciting program in the next several weeks. In the meantime, I encourage New Yorkers to go to betterbin.nyc to help us answer the question, what should New York City's next generation litter baskets look like? In addition, this budget includes $760,000 in fiscal year 2019, increasing to 1.2 million in fiscal year 2022 for maintenance contracts to support the operation of the city's marine transfer station. 
These contracts include fire alarm inspection, ventilation system cleaning and maintenance, and other similar services. Together with the additional maintenance staff included in the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget, these contracts will ensure these facilities are able to operate for decades to come. To maximize our use of resources, the department projects to achieve savings in the fiscal 2019 budget that will include its agency allocation share of citywide savings through reduced civilian overtime, phone plan charges, travel expenses, and procurement reform for vendors to facilitate online processing. The capital portion of the department's fiscal year 2019 executive budget is $495 million, which includes funding for facility construction and vehicle purchases. The budget includes full funding for all our vehicle and equipment replacement cycles. In addition, from 2019 to 2023, the department is funded to complete construction of the Southwest Marine Transfer Station, which we expect to open later this year. Continue construction of the East 91st Street Marine Transfer Station, which we expect to open in the first half of calendar year 2019. Continue the modernization of the West 59th Street Marine Transfer Station, together with the demolition of the Gansevoort Marine Transfer Station. Begin construction of the new Brooklyn 3 garage in this coming fiscal year. Complete the design of the new Staten Island 1-3 garage and begin construction in fiscal year 20. Renovate the Queens 1113 garage. Design and then begin construction of a new Queens 1 garage and replace the Bronx 9-10-11 garage. In addition, for the past several years, the department has invested in the renovation or construction of personnel facilities. The department has conducted a complete assessment of its garages lacking suitable bathrooms and locker rooms for its female workers. We are now nearing completion of this program. By the end of fiscal year 2019, I expect all female facility upgrades to be complete. We are currently assessing our personnel spaces for heating and air conditioning requirements for the next phase of upgrades. In addition, as we prepare to be evicted this September from the Manhattan 6 garage near Hudson Yards, we are rehabilitating personnel and office spaces at three locations on the east side of Manhattan. This will facilitate ongoing service to District 6 while we continue to work toward a long-term facility to serve this community. Going forward, the department will build on its progress and commitment to increase recycling participation and diversion to set the city on a path to achieve our goal of sending zero waste goal by 2030. A few weeks ago, DSNY kicked off our annual spring safe disposal events. At safe disposal events, which stands for solvents, automotive, flammable, and electronic products, New Yorkers can drop off potentially harmful household products for proper recycling or disposal. Accepted products include household cleaners, unwanted or expired medications, automotive fluids, paint, batteries, and electronics. We hold two events annually in each borough, one in the spring and one in the fall, but each event is open to New York City residents from any borough. Our next safe event will be take place this Sunday on West 120th Street in Morningside Heights in Manhattan. Residents can find out more about about it on our website at nyc.gov slash safe disposal or by calling 311. This fall, the department will expand its curbside electronic waste collection service to southern Brooklyn and western Queens. In areas with curbside e-waste collection, residents living in buildings with nine or fewer dwelling units can schedule a pickup appointment for unwanted televisions, computers, and other electronics covered by the New York State e-waste disposal ban. This service is currently offered in northern Brooklyn and on Staten Island. The department also continues to work with its partners, Housing Works and Electronic Recyclers International, to expand the Refashion NYC and eCycle NYC programs in larger apartment buildings across the city so that residents can drop off unwanted clothing and electronics free of charge. Currently, more than 13,000 residential buildings with 830,000 households are enrolled in the eCycle NYC program and more than 1,500 buildings with 158,000 households are enrolled in the Refashion NYC program. This year, we will continue efforts to grow these programs, and we have recently expanded capacity to process textile donations through a new partnership with the Salvation Army. As we discussed with the Council at the previous hearing on the City's 2017 Waste Characterization Study, we must have a robust organics waste diversion program to meet our ambitious zero waste goals. 
Presently, the re Residential Organics Curbside Program serves 3.5 million New Yorkers and is by far the largest and most expansive curbside organics collection program in the United States. We believe that for the program to be successful over the long term, we must ensure New Yorkers are getting the very best service when curbside organics collection reaches their neighborhood. To achieve this, the city is evaluating its current service with the goal of increasing efficiencies and streamlining the program. At this time, the city has temporarily placed the implementation schedule for expanding the program to additional districts on hold. In the interim, residents in the current participating areas will continue receiving curbside organics collection service while the department continues intensive outreach in these neighborhoods to grow participation. We will also continue supporting green market drop-off programs across the city where residents can drop off their organic waste for collection. Working with our neighborhood partners and local nonprofit organizations, we continue to promote the expansion and growth of new community composting sites across all five boroughs. Earlier this year, we completed construction of a new and expanded community compost site along the Gowanus Canal in partnership with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy and Big Reuse. The department will continue to look for opportunities and seek innovative ways to increase recycling diversion and participation rates across the city and look forward to working with you and the city council to achieve these mutual goals. As you know, the, city, the department operates a sizable fleet of trucks and other vehicles to collect recyclables and dispose of waste, clean streets and vacant lots, and clear snow and ice. When I appeared before you in March at the preliminary budget hearing, members of the Sanitation Committee expressed interest in the department's sustainable vehicle fleet. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some elements of our fleet program, which continues to be among the cleanest heavy-duty fleets in the nation. Thanks to new technologies and our agency's commitment to lead in the research, development, and testing of cleaner fuels and emissions, an effort the department began over 20 years ago, we have achieved success in dramatically reducing emissions of particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, and other air pollutants from our fleet. Currently, all of the department's heavy-duty diesel vehicles utilize the industry's latest computer-controlled and regulated clean diesel engines for their respective model years. While the department's light-duty fleet incorporates hybrid electric, plug-in el hybrid electric, and all-electric technology to minimize vehicle emissions. In fiscal year 2018, the department ordered 446 new collection trucks, an accelerated purchase to take advantage of favorable contract pricing. These new trucks will be in full compliance with EPA Phase 1 greenhouse gas standards and will augment our fleet of sustainable collection trucks. To further lower emissions, the department is currently using B20 biodiesel, 20% coming from soybeans, forage trucks citywide. We use B20 generally from April 15th through November 15th and B5 during the colder months. We are currently conducting a pilot for use of B20 throughout the winter at 14 district locations, and the results so far look promising. While we have achieved much to date, we believe more improvements are possible as technology advances, and we are excited to be at the forefront of testing other kinds of alternative fuels and technologies. Toward that end, I am very pleased that as part of the city's clean fleet plan, the administration recently announced it will use for the first time renewable diesel, a low emissions 99% petroleum-free fuel to power over a thousand large heavy-duty vehicles, including some sanitation trucks. Renewable diesel is made almost exclusively of plants and animal fats with just 1% of its composition derived from petroleum. In addition, in 2019, the department will receive from Mack Trucks a fully electric demonstration refuse collection truck equipped with an integrated electric drivetrain system to test in its daily operations. This represents a significant opportunity for the department to test a truly zero emissions vehicle, the first of its kind manu manufactured by Mack Trucks and one of the first in its class nationwide. As we now enjoy longer daylight hours and warming temperatures, though apparently no sun, we are pleased to put the 2017-18 snow season behind us. This past snow season seemed to never end. We received more than five inches of snow on April 2nd, the day after Easter, and the total of more than 40 inches of snow was nearly 50% more than the average annual snow accumulation for New York City. The department's snow budget for fiscal 2019 is funded for $97.7 million, an increase of $13.6 million from the $84.1 million funded in the fiscal year 2018 adopted budget. 
Additionally, our current spending estimate for fiscal 18 now stands at 107.2 million. The department expects to hire between 400 and 500 new sanitation workers this summer, depending on the rate of attrition. These new employees will receive snow operations training before the start of next winter. Going into the 2018-19 snow season, the department will have adequate staffing with over 6,500 sanitation workers available to be prepared for whatever Mother Nature has in store for us. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the funding of the department's program and operations over the next fiscal year. The department has always recognized the vital role of the department in keeping communities across the city healthy, safe, and clean, and we will continue to uphold high standards in our delivery of the essential services we provide to the public. We also welcome your support and partnership in carrying out all of our future agency initiatives. My staff and I will now be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions and then open it up to the rest of my colleagues. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that we've also been joined by Councilmember Mario, Valone, Cohen, and Jonai. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, <laughs> so the Council's response to the Mayor's uh, uh, 2018 preliminary budget called upon the administration to include $10 million to increase public awareness regarding the city's goal of achieving zero waste in New York City by 2030. Um, it aims to eliminate the need to send waste to out-of-state landfills. Um, and currently, it is unclear whether the city is on track to meet this goal, um, given that the uh, diversion rate hovers at around 20 percent. Uh, can you please explain to the committee why the the, for the second year this budgetary request was not included, and can we expect to see it in the executive plan? I think what we're going for here is that even though um, you've done a good job at uh, speaking in to individual initiatives um, uh, re related to educating and informing the public, there's no one grand plan to educate uh, the, the folks of the city of New York on zero waste. Um, and we were hoping that 10 million can help you do that. I'm sure, that, I'm sure 10 million would help me do that. Um, we really have been focused, you're quite correct, on, on uh, outreach and campaigns and advertising that have to do with providing a message to the public specifically about an action they can take. Um, we're currently running a subway ad campaign for Donate NYC as well as for Refashion because it's clean out your closet time of year. Um, we are happy to look to designate within our current outreach budget, which is pretty robust, a specific amount of money to do more advertising. But I think that it would be useful to have you sit with us and the creatives around what that campaign looks like. Um, because I, I really always want to try and tie it to something that someone can do. I mean, one of the things about waste that's, you know, different than somewhat Vision Zero is people are making decisions about what they buy every day. And all of those decisions impacts what happens at the end of its useful life. Um, and I really want to make sure that we're engaging in a way uh, that's helpful. And so we're willing to look within our budget to try and allocate more money for this, but no OMB did not provide additional funding for it. And I, I saw the ads on, <clears throat> well, Jonathan Seltzer saw the ads on the train this morning um, related to cleaning out your closet. So I, I know you're out there doing the work. Um, I just wish that we could tie it into like one central theme and really push it. And I just want to put it to, to relative to Vision Zero, where the budget is $10 million a year just for Vision Zero, not any of the other initiatives. And I believe that your marketing budget is like $2.5 million across the board when it comes to the Department of Sanitation. So I just want to make sure that we have some equity when it comes to these uh, achieving zero goals, whether it's a uh, uh, pedestrian safety or um, uh, moving trash or not allowing trash to go on land. Right. Like, like, why don't we work together to try and figure out what that campaign could look like uh, and how that could tie together. And perhaps we can, we, we will work hard to identify a specific amount of money to focus on that uh, within our current budget. Uh, with respect to uh, CNG powered vehicles and now your electric Mack truck, which I'm very excited to see. I hope it looks cool. Um, it, uh, it really looks like a regular garbage truck, uh, the one I saw. <laughs> okay, it's all right. We got to have like some exposed uh, battery situation. Exactly, some battery, exactly. Um, <clears throat> it'll just be, it'll just be nice. But um, uh, in my in my district specifically in North Brooklyn, we know the South Bronx and Southeast Queens suffer from high rates of asthma, a lot of truck traffic and pollution. Um, what, what we're hoping is that in co locations where you have CNG infrastructure for ref refueling, um, that you can 
look into whether or not you can pilot um, the CNG trucks for now, that we have them now in these areas so that we can start talking about uh, environmental justice in these communities. I know we have some CNG trucks. I know you're concerned about uh, getting a larger fleet uh, because a larger, without the infrastructure, without the refueling stations, I can only imagine a, a, a truck getting stuck in the snow because we couldn't find an appropriate place to refill it. Uh, but in North Brooklyn, we do have CNG stations, um, um, and in parts of, of uh, New Jersey, especially near the Covanza facility, um, which means that parts of the west side, I guess, of Manhattan. So, so um, what, we, I know we've had this conversation several times, and I mean, I know that Covanta would definitely like me to be using their CNG station. We don't go to New Jersey when it's snowing. Um, and so the, the real constraint is how quickly I can fuel the snow fleet. And that is, that is the driver of, of why we have not moved in that direction. We actually think that the Cummins engine is, doesn't tend to last as long as a regular diesel engine, but the savings on the diesel is usually offsets uh, that cost change. Um, so we're not opposed to the CNG truck. It's really the question of being able to fast fuel them as quickly as we can do the diesel fleet because my most vulnerable time during snow is when the entire fleet comes in to get refueled. Because that can means we, I've got nothing out plowing. Can we take time to have a conversation about these three communities and whether or not there's an opportunity um, in locations like Southeast Queens and North Brooklyn both have CNG refueling stations. Um, and maybe there's a conversation to be had where we can focus these trucks on non-snow days specifically to be along the route, along our routes in these communities so that, again, we can see some environmental justice. I am not opposed to that. I need to have that fleet be above and beyond what I have now because, you know, we use, we use the re regular fleet to plow. So I'd need, like, a whole separate fleet then. I mean, which has not, there's not, there's not been a lot of room for that from Fleet Central of wanting me to do that. But we're certainly willing to continue looking at it. I mean, but that has been our biggest struggle. Um, has been the issue of can I operationally meet the demands of snow with these types of vehicles? And so far, that really hasn't been true. Okay, and I hear, I think we should sit down and talk about it. Sure. Um, I'm just trying to figure out ways to really, again, given that we're, we haven't passed intro 495 and we haven't done other things, or intro 157 now, and other things to bring about justice to these communities that maybe we can do something in the interim to bring down the level of pollution that's happening in these communities. Um, I'm gonna have one more question so I could uh, allow for my colleagues to, to ask questions as well. Um, I have a, the executive plan includes $620,000 for radios and accessories. Um, this is in addition to prior allocations made in recent years for similar purchases. For example, in fiscal year 2017, the preliminary budget included $400,000 to replace 200 handheld radios. So when we see almost half a million dollars for 200 handheld radios, we know they're, they're very expensive. I would like to actually see one of these radios. Oh, sure. They, they look like, uh, yeah, we can, we, can, we can show you any of the radios. Um, I, I, I don't have the math in front of me, but they're very expensive radios. Yeah. Um, I would expect that uh, given how expensive they are, that they would already come with their accessories, uh, like chargers or whatever it is that you would need, that we wouldn't have to add another $620,000 to to meet the, uh, I guess, the, the, uh, to, to get accessories for these radios that already cost a lot. We're talking about $1 million for like outfitting 200 handheld radios. And that just doesn't, doesn't add up. Exactly, to I mean, uh, to do all of our radios, probably gonna be more like $8 million. I mean, like it's, it's, radios are very expensive and we have thousands of them. Um, and they do need docking stations and stuff like that. They do come as a package, but I mean, it's, uh, they are very expensive. I wish they were not. I also wish that we didn't have to replace everything, but we do because of changes uh, federally with uh, the wavelengths. What about the bidding? In bidding, uh, is, there, uh, is there only one company that makes these radios that allows them to charge so much? Um, and, and, and I know folks here understand the city of New York's procurement process is a lot different than going to like Best Buy and buying radios, uh, but we're talking about an exorbitant cost for what I consider you know, for radio, um, I would just like to see it. And I just want somebody in my staff, if you guys could just do the math of what $400,000 for 2,000 handheld radios is. I think it's 2,000, but I want to make sure. So, I mean, we're happy to, I mean, I don't always think, despite how big we are, that we get the best pricing on everything. And they are made by Motorola. Um, 
And so we are certainly willing to take you through it. I mean, it's, you know, uh, procurement is a process. All right, well, uh, thank but, you. Uh, but I mean, I, I hate the fact that they cost so much as yeah, well. $2,000 a radio. You could buy a smaller used car for that. Um, so. <laughs> I know, but the car won't communicate with my staff. Really <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a hoopty at that price, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> So now I just want to, um, I have more questions that I'll ask um, after all my colleagues have asked questions. I want to make sure that their, their time is spent um, uh, wisely here. So I want to call on uh, Councilmember Cabrera, who will then be followed by Councilmember Powers, Malone, and Cohen. And I want to acknowledge the fact that we've also been joined by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so uh, you actually uh, started to address uh, a question that I was very intrigued because we did talk about this, uh, brought it up in the preliminary uh, hearing about fully electric uh, trucks, and we talked about the possibility of Tesla and so forth. Uh, have they communicated to you how fast they could reload? How fast they I, could I don't think the they've battery? gotten gotten there yet. They they have just put out and they put out a press release with us to say that they would give us the first one. So. We don't have it yet. So until it hits the streets of New York and we find out how it works, I, I'm not going to base the numbers on anything. But I'm surprised they didn't give you the specs. You know, usually. Well, if, if we can ask them for it. I'm sure they would provide what they think it will do. Okay, that's interesting. And I'm sure you communicated to them what well, your needs Absolutely. prior to them building it. It makes yep. no sense them building something that all of a sudden, oops, by the way, you know, you never asked us that we needed this and that. So I'm, I'm happy uh, to hear that there's a step forward um, in the right direction when it comes to fully electric uh, trucks. Uh, the, I, I meant to ask you about the hiring of the four and 500 new sanitation workers this mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. uh, is this uh, basically to replace uh, the attrition that's going to be taking place? So it, it is uh, some attrition and there's some additions. Uh, so uh, there's basic attrition going on and then there's the MTSs that need staffing for Southwest and 91st Street and then there's also there's some new programs such as the Clean NYC 2.0 and the RATS program uh, where there was additional basket trucks and a second pickup in many of the areas that the mayor announced last summer. Okay. Uh, those we're my only question. It's easy okay. today. Thank you so much, Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the sake of time. I know we're running out of time here, so thank you so much. N no problem. And I'm going to modify the timing. It's not going to be three minutes. It's going to be five minutes per council member in the first round. So if you have more questions, please ask. I'll take his. Uh, I'll <laughs> take my so you're gonna, we're going to add to your original three minutes uh, the one minute that was left over by council member Cabrera. There no, so um, five you. minutes, and then we'll get a second round. Um, we have a good a good crew here. I think we'll go through these questions pretty pretty. Thank you and thank you. I should say thank you for letting the members get their questions in early. I did not do that and I got yelled at last minute. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, I want to start with the um, there's a for commercial waste zones. There's money in the budget about a million and a half dollars to do consulting work around the commercial waste zones and uh, that I think had been moved up for, moved up to. Uh, or have been moved money. Can you just give us an update on where you are in terms of that work? Absolutely. And, and also what findings and where we are in terms of uh, the overall plan? Absolutely. So we anticipate that um, we will be releasing, as we said, uh, this summer, the implementation plan uh, for the proposal on commercial waste zones. This will kick up a very intensive process with the council. We will need to draft legislation. Um, as well as perform an environmental impact statement and all of the things that go along with that. Uh, but we have done, like, we've had an incredibly intensive uh, interaction with a variety of stakeholders, uh, from labor to the private carding industry to buildings to bids to small businesses. Um, you know, we've had over 150 meetings with over 100 individual stakeholders. Uh, and at this point in time, what we are looking is we still don't have exactly what the numbers will be. We're still refining that. Um, but we have determined that we are going to go with a non-exclusive option in every zone of two to five carters in every neighborhood. Um, and the neighborhoods will be primarily based around community boards just because that's an easy geography that people know. Um, 
and we still anticipate that we are going to get a similar reduction in vehicle miles traveled as we proposed originally, which was, I believe, 48 to 60 something percent. We still expect to be in that range. Uh, so we are moving through and trying to wrap it up and put all the information together so we can give you something so uh, sometime, by the summer. Sometime this summer, you'll have your report or your plan, the, the plan. together to send to us. Okay, thanks. Yep. On the uh, on the part of your testimony around Manhattan Six Garage near Hudson Yards, um, you mentioned something we've talked about, of course. Uh, the um, three locations on the east side of Manhattan. Can you tell me those three locations that uh, where you are uh, rehabilitating person? I'm just re rehabilitating personnel and office spaces. Certainly, I didn't remember it, so someone okay. reminded me. Uh, so they're all around, more or less around First Avenue or between First and Second. And so it's 12th Street, 26th Street, and East 60th Street. And East 60th Street. And that's where you have facilities today in your... We have, we have, off, we, we have what are called section stations. Um, and the section station usually is because, you know, someone was far away from the actual garage is where they can stop and use the bathroom, and there's the showers, and there's uh, office space for supervisors. Um, so we hadn't been using them really, and so we're rehabilitating them so that there's some place for the sanitation workers to go. But we don't have a location for the trucks. Right, and but that, but those are the, those are. The, I mean, as as I understand, in our last meeting, that that's the, those are the three locations. Those are the three locations. The park, as well. Am I right about that? That's that would those would be parking locations. Even if you got a garage tomorrow, you would still yeah, have to park. Yeah, they're gonna. The, I got no. I got nowhere else to put the trucks. Yep. Got it. Um, thank you. The third um, topic is uh, styrofoam. Yes. A topic I'm sure that is uh, near and dear to your heart. Where are we on, uh, where are we in the world? In the world, so oral arguments were heard in January. We have not heard from the judge. That is where we are at the moment. I would be very happy if you did a straight ban here in the council, but. Uh, if we got a straight ban. But so we're waiting for a, and then do you need any money to do, I mean, is there any, do you need anything in the budget? You don't need anything in terms of. We'll, we'll be able to use, I mean, we'll do, we'll do mailers to, uh, you know, affected businesses. We'll do some promotional activity, um, but, you know. Is there money in the budget for that if it happened today? No, there's nothing specifically you know. designated because I don't, I don't have any idea when it's going to yeah, happen. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we'll figure it out when it comes up, but we think that, you know, if we need to talk to OMB, if we think we need a big outreach campaign, we, but I think we'll probably be able to internally fund that. Got it. The last question I had was on the, you know, my time is withering. Uh, uh, I, had, I had heard from some folks in, in the industry that glass was a problem around uh, uh, recycling and so, breaking, and I was wondering if there was any plans around glass. I, I, I never heard that, so I was wondering if there's any plans around glass specifically, whether it's re like recycling or take back, or that it was they were having difficulty around recycling because of glass. I don't know. Um, so glass is the least valuable portion of the recycling stream. Um, we don't, uh, and you know, it challenge. It's the most challenging portion of the of the stream. Um, our facility in. Um, not our facility, Sims facility, where our material goes. It then goes to a glass place across in uh, New Jersey. The challenge is finding new uses for it because of mixed colors are not acceptable to bottlers. Um, and particularly green glass is a problem for bottlers. It is easier on the West Coast where they have a larger wine industry. So there to be an opportunity, it's not as robust here on the East Coast. Uh, but it is not impossible, and yes, so what is happening, at least this is my understanding of what is happening, is uh, they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, and when we started requiring them to do the right thing, they suddenly had a problem. Would it define do the right thing? They actually are recycling, like, you know, people are, we are, we are enforcing on the commercial side to make sure people are recycling. Okay. Um, it is primarily an issue of contamination if you go to a single stream facility. So if you're putting bottles with paper, that can contaminate paper. But paper in and of itself is a challenging commodity at the moment as well, so. Okay, thank you, thanks. It's, uh, it's amazing that we're talking about the value of metal, glass, plastic, and paper, and how, how hard it is to find the market for those um, as we recycle them. 
and uh, folks have conversations about recycling styrofoam. Um, it, it's just remarkable to me. Remarkable to me. You, you know it that ironic. <laughs> huh? You find it ironic? I do. I do find it ironic. I think uh, I just found out that China is saying that they're not going to take any paper from us if it has more than like a 0.5 percent contamination. China, China, China's closed. They're China's been closed since January. Yeah. It is having serious impacts on the mixed paper market. So even paper at this point is going to lose its value or has already lost its value. Paper, there have been weeks in which uh, one of our vendors has had to pay people to take the paper. Right. So. And this is less than a year after we were getting like a hundred and something dollars per ton. Right. So now glass and paper are a problem. You could only imagine if we add another item to that styrofoam specifically, especially contaminated one. It just doesn't make any, any sense when it comes to like the, what we're doing here um, in trying to um, actually find value for these mm -hmm. items. Uh, so I want to move on. I, um, I want to acknowledge the fact that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Gudenchik as well. Uh, we're going to go with uh, Valone, Cohen, and Jonai in that order. So Council Member Valone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. How are Just you? Just wanted to follow up on our previous conversations, and now you have in the fiscal executive plan 400,000 going to 1.2 million up to 2022 for our marine transfer stations. Just some of the support contracts. So, if you could, um, what areas will we be aiding in those marine transfer stations, and how much is that for the support contracts? Uh, so that is the money for the support contracts, not for the personal services because we have maintenance staff that we are assigning as well. But those are things that are more specialized, such as fire alarms that have to be maintained or duct cleaning, which can be really problematic in a transfer station, as well as like crane maintenance. Um, those are all sort of beyond the capacity of what we can do in-house. But we also have uh, staff that we will be assigning to those facilities as well to make sure that they are cared for going into the future, considering the capital investment we've made. We want to make sure they last for a long time. So there's additional staff budgeted for those stations? There is additional both sanitation workers as well as civilian trade staff uh, that are going to be there. So how does that break down? Do you, do you have that? Yeah, I do actually have uh, the difference. So at Hamilton, we have 60 uniform staff that work there and 17 civilian staff. And that's a bit of a mix between the trades. And there's a, like one or two clericals there. Uh, at, North Shore, it's 5917. At Southwest, it's 4616. And at 91st Street, it'll be 4616. And we will also continue to engage with OMB around whether or not that's exactly the right number or if we picked the right trade. So it's like we've picked, you know, electricians and plumbers and make sure that we have the right people there to ensure that this can be taken care of. So it's not for all transfer stations? Those are the, those are the ones that we... I, I didn't hear College Point, sorry. So it was That's North Shore. That's North Shore. That's North Shore. So for the capacity that are going in through our transfer stations now, do you see that on the rise, steady, or how are we looking at the stations? No, I mean, refuse, uh, the refuse volumes have been pretty steady uh, across the city for wherever they're going. So, um, you know, North Shore has been performing well. And what we'd like to see with that, because it's an ongoing, it'll be consistent, is the working with sister agencies on the locations of the stations as well as DOT needs and some of the infrastructure around the transfer stations. I think we need to do a better job at the neighborhoods that surround the transfer stations, the streets that we're mm -hmm. using. Um, clearly the wear and tear around North Shore is, you know, that those, those, even, they, before, they, even before the transfer station was there, there's been issues over it uh, there. But yes, I think the, you, you should have a four by four. Yeah. I, if I you are. That, that or you're airborne driving one of your cars. But, yeah. Um, is there capital talk in the budget between DOT and sanitation as to infrastructure needs around some of the stations? Um, we have not had that in depth. I actually think it probably isn't a, a capital. It might be more of an expense repaving need, at least around North Shore. Um, at the other facilities, it's obviously, um, it is not as negative as it is around North Shore in terms of the streets. I mean, Hamilton, Ave Hamilton is, I basically feel like it's been under construction forever, but um, is also next door to a DOT facility, their asphalt plant. Um, and then 91st Street, obviously, York is in decent shape, and there's been some work up there. And then uh, Southwest 
is off of the belt, and therefore, I mean, that street is not in terrible shape. So, but we can follow up with DOT to make sure that around our facilities, which are often in industrial areas that tend not to get as much repaving attention, um, but College Point's getting quite fancy now with the police over there and other and other happenings. So. <laughs> Don't we, tell the police that. But. We, we used to be alone with the garage out there, so uh, now we have company. Well, I think that would be a good place for us to start, is to okay. look at some coordination with the agencies with capital, because the needs, not just at, at North Shore, but it's, I'm, I'm sure it's, it echoes similarly at the other stations with the streets being overutilized by, by our commercial fleet. Um, the streets are in critical condition, and I, it's, it's, you, you speak to DOT about it, they don't have it in the budget. We talk to Sanitation about it, they don't have it in the budget. You talk to uh, EDC about it, and they're talking about Willits Point, and I keep bringing up, I said, well, the more you expand, the more these streets are collapsing, so we need to really take a look. So, um, Mr. Chair, maybe we can have some focus as to the, the interaction between the agencies on the infrastructure around these transfer stations, because the, the residing communities are just can't handle the breakdown of the streets, and no one has it in their capital plans. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Malone. Uh, now, uh, follow, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Andy King as well. Just want to acknowledge that he was here. It'll be Councilmember Cohen, Joe Nye, and then Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, first, I will report, uh, I think not last week and the weekend before, I took a trip to Orchard Beach and did safe recycling and I got rid of a ton of bad stuff in the house and the experience could not have been any better. I, when they do it on my side at Lehman College, the experience has also been very good, but uh, it could not have been easier at Orchard Beach. Um, I have a question about uh, the street uh, waste baskets in the district. I, we've had conversations about um, home household waste ending up in my street baskets and and then I have overflowing street mm -hmm. baskets. Is there any enforcement? Do we, you know, do you have any data on enforcement? Are we? When there is enforcement, the challenge is, is um, catching people who are doing it. Um, if it ends up in the litter basket and not next to the litter basket, it is possible to go through and then we have the ability to sort of use if you put your mail in it to try and track them down. Um, so we, we do have enforcement, but it is an ongoing challenge. Do, do we ever actually do any enforcement? We, we have do. The, we have the we, ability to do it. Do we, we do. Actually we do any? actually do enforcement. Do you, do you, can you, is there any data on how many citations are issued? Or I don't, I don't have that with me, but we can certainly get it for you. I, I would be interested. Um, and last, I, I think that uh, Councilman Powers may have asked this, but in, in supporting recycling, I was just at a, a recycling facility in the Bronx last week, and, and they were telling me about the difficulty, uh, particularly with glass. Yes, Ashton uh, has been whining for quite a while now. Well, yeah. <laughs> is, the, is there anything that you think that we could be doing to either create a market, support a market? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that one of the things that I think would be useful in the market is to require glass as part of some of the construction projects. That is usually where residential glass on the East Coast ends up. Um, as being sort of, a, you know, if you need to re-elevate something, it can be used for that or within, as an aggregate within concrete or something like that. I think there's some ways we could do it within our contracts. Um, uh, so I think that's one option. Uh, I think the other question, which is really much more of a state question, is whether or not you would expand the bottle bill to things like wine bottles, which is a big chunk of the glass world. How, how would that be helpful to you? Well, I mean, it's it just when they become more valuable, we tend to not necessarily end up with the beer bottles in our waste room. They tend to take them out. Oh, okay. Uh, so. All right. uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to continue uh, on that topic for a moment, of the recycling program that we currently have, including glass, mm -hmm. um, does it get recycled or does it work its way into our landfills at no, some it, point? No, it really does get recycled. I mean, like there is a portion, so the, the plastic bags that much of the material comes in does not, obviously, and there is some contamination that falls out, but no, uh, none of our contractors are allowed to landfill any beneficially reusable material. So all glass that is recycled is, is I guess, finds a home somewhere, not in our landfills. Yes, that is, that is correct. Okay. 
Can you tell me about the organic recycling? Sure, certainly. So, I mean, it is a very exciting time to be in organics. And I have to say, uh, you know, really seeing New Yorkers start to step up and do it has been uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and, you know, we're doing it in places like Stuyvesant Town as well as much of sort of the single family homes. And so, uh, obviously, it is not mandatory yet. Uh, I hope someday, but I don't think everyone else is ready yet. Um, and, you know, we are seeing participation, and so that is usually going, so there are several outlets for it. Uh, obviously, there's our, our own facility on Staten Island. Then there are the community compost sites that we have around the city. Some of the material actually is turned into biogas at Newtown Creek. Uh, and then some of it, I think, I can't remember if American's going to McEnroe right now, um, but we also are seeing investment in the private sector and expansion in pro processing capacity. Can you tell me the approximate tonnage on a... So we did about 1,000 tons last week. 1,000 tons a week? Yeah. What does that equivalent to the cost factor for that 1,000 tons? I don't have that number, but I'm certainly, we could get that. I and don't have it in the exact way. concerned to you. see if the squeeze is worth the juice, as they say. Uh, we are exactly where I anticipated we'd be uh, as we uh, rolled out this program. It is uh, very similar. I'd actually say moving a little bit faster than the original recycling program. So um, it's, been a, it's been an exciting journey. So I, 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 uh, I look forward to continuing it. And quickly on the radio investment. Yes. Um, are we going to piggyback off of some of the other departments, such as the NYPD, and uh, see if we can benefit from bulk purchase discount using similar technology, obviously wave bands and taking into consideration? Uh, I just, it, that amount of money sounds like a tremendous amount. And I think I'm they're also getting thinking the same of maybe pricing. Why radios? Why not cell phones? Oh, no, I want radios. I don't want cell phones. In an emergency, you cannot use a cell phone. Uh, in Sandy, I would have lost every single truck. I'm sorry? Uh, in Hurricane Sandy, I would not have been able to communicate with anybody in uh, Southeast Queens. Anybody who went out to the Rockaways would basically have gone into a dead zone. The radios worked, the cell phones didn't. Um, so we have a lot of technology in our trucks, but we need to make sure that it can work in case of a really serious emergency, and this is still, this is still a technology that we think is more appropriate. I would encourage uh, looking to benefit from bulk purchase discount. NYPD, fire department, EMS, uh, there are so many agencies that use uh, radios, and I would hope that we can figure out how to collectively buy and benefit, but I'll leave that to your better judgment. Maybe we can talk to me offline about it. Talk to me a bit about the um, expansion of commercial corridor pickup. When do they normally pick up on commercial corridors, the typical wastebasket? Oh, it, it, can, it varies completely. There are some places in Staten Island where they will only get collected twice a week on the normal collection route. And then there are some busier commercial areas where they could be picked up on multiple shifts. And my understanding is that some communities only get once a week pickup. No, they all get at least twice a week pickup. It's a minimum twice a minimum week. Minimum of twice a week. Okay. And what would it cost to go back to the good old days where we had more frequent pickup citywide of commercial corridors, which would add to the quality of life, the litter problem, and the rodent problem that we are currently exploring, very expensive options? Um, so, I mean, it depends on how much. We, we, we really try and focus not just on basket trucks, but what we think would be the most appropriate way to keep the neighborhoods clean. And I think that's why we've been focused on the Clean 2.0 to really experiment in North Brooklyn, one of our most challenging areas, uh, to see whether or not this mix works and gets the job done. We asked for seven days a week pickup. There are some places that get seven days a week pickup. What would the cost factor be? Because we put in, the city council, the administrator, the administrator has put in zero and we, uh, I believe requested $7 million in additional funding for sanitation for adequate commercial corridor pickup of trash. So it would be, it would start if we assume that they are. Uh, did they move that clock on me? Chairman, did you speed up that clock? <laughs> I'm right. sure he didn't speed up the clock. So it would start at $4 million if you assume that this is the entry level salary and rise to $7.1 in the out year. I would encourage you to help us find that money. Um, this you don't always need it. You just, I mean, like, I'm, I'm just going to be very clear. There are areas of the city that don't need it. Um, I want to, in my communications with the bids, the business improvement districts, a large percentage of their budget 
is going to the sanitation uh, work that's needed. They're investing in cleaner sidewalks, more yeah. frequent pickups. So they're using that money well, they don't pick for city up the, services. They don't pick up the baskets. They may, they may take the, the bag out, but they aren't supposed to be taking the material anywhere. Right, but it's my understanding that when those garbage cans get filled and people start piling trash bags on this next to these bins, that they pick it up. They're not supposed to be picking it up. So we should leave it there for that two-day-a-week pickup. Well, though, though you're talking about an area that's not getting two day a week pickup, I don't believe. Um, I, I can look this at is where my you're feedback from all of the bids citywide, 75 of them. Uh, most of them have explained to me that a good portion of their budget goes into sanitation, additional services, which to me is mind boggling. So, I mean, all of the bid areas have a, probably all have seven day a week service. I mean, I would be very surprised if there's a single bid without seven-day-a-week service. I will certainly circle back to you on that one. And really quickly, because i got so much to talk to you about, uh, talk to me about the Next Generation Litter Basket Design Competition. Um, is it going to cost the city any money? I mean, Grandma always said a garbage can is a garbage can. And its purpose is just that, to collect trash. Mm -hmm. So I look at the three different cans that we have currently, right? The old wire can, which I believe is about $250 a can. No, it's less than that. It's How much like is it? It's closer to uh, like 125. 125. How much is the they call it the high end? It depends on which high end. The one that silver is about 500. The ones that are next sort of green or other colors are are closer to a thousand. And tell me about the Rolls Royce, the pot belly, the the big, big belly. belly uh, the big belly with its service contract is seven thousand. Isn't that insane? Seven thousand dollars for a trash can that. It's um, I, I think that it's very expensive, but the idea of the Big Belly is that uh, it is able to keep vermin away from food sources. And doesn't that what, isn't that what the high-end trash can does? It does. It is not sealed as completely as a Big Belly is. What was the cost of the high-end? About a thousand. And what's the cost of the uh, Rolls Royce? Uh, well, it's about thirty-five hundred before you add the maintenance contract. So Seven thousand versus a thousand. I can get seven garbage cans instead of one. I, I am, you, you are quite correct let's in that. Let's start spending taxpayer dollars more wisely, please. And let's increase the budget so we can have more frequency pickups. We're just looking for ways that we can make our tax dollars go a little bit further and meet the needs of all New Yorkers. And the, what, is there going to be a consultant fee or uh, in this competition, the design competition that we're looking at to redesign a garbage can? Yeah, we have a little bit of uh, assistance with people to coordinate the competition, but it's very minimal. Okay, and ultimately, if there is a new design that's accepted, approved, and someone decides this is the best thing since chocolate milk, uh, what do we do with the old garbage cans, the ones that we spent upward of 7000 on? And well, we, I, I assume that we would, not, we would not retire anything that was still usable. I mean, obviously, I have 23,000 litter baskets on the streets of New York. Uh, if we find, I actually happen to like the iconic glitter uh, wire mesh basket, uh, but it does have some challenges. I mean, it is, a, you are, a, you know, vermin can get into it. It's pretty heavy. Uh, but I'm just afraid of the cost factor for this so design. We, 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 we would not go out and purchase or make the determination to completely change out all of our baskets unless we came back to the council. And my last question, and thank you for the consideration, on zoning. Yes. Um, the idea of what once was a problem with a monopoly, and we had real corruption and mm -hmm. uh, organized crime and mm -hmm. the formation of BIC to weed out all of the craziness and open up the commercial carding mm -hmm. industry to fair competition, which benefited uh, all of our mom and pop shops and commercial corridors. Why would we revert back to a similar practice that was problematic for decades? That bred fraud, corruption, organized crime, manipulation of market on the cost of small businesses. So there are a couple of things. One is we're not planning to give any Carter uh, a monopoly. That would be the first thing. The second thing is the market's pretty uh, um, concentrated. Basically, there are two players who have half the market right now. So you 
you, you have less competition than you think you do. Uh, mom and pops pay more than big commercial areas, the way this, this system works. And then in addition, we have excessively long routes, which makes things uh, more dangerous to the public. And so we really want to see that we have an environmental, uh, we have a cost factor in here. We do not want to see service costs blow up. That is not an objective. Um, we are not trying, in many other areas, the government uses the franchise to raise a lot of revenue. They add a big fee onto the franchise. Uh, we're not planning to do that. This is not about raising money for like a back channel tax, uh, which it often is in other areas. Uh, so there actually are a lot of challenges within the carding industry, which I'm happy to go into detail with you, but I think that this is really trying to address, um, you know, there are areas of the city that have 50 carters on the same block. That's insane. Um, so It's called the free market. That's what this country is built on. I know, but it's, it's also... Uh, we're it's not also controlling markets. It's we're, we're, we allow the we're market gonna, to uh, dictate who survives and who does it. Uh, if there are 50 carters out there, that means there's a demand. Someone is competing against another provider, therefore the beneficiary is going to be the end user. And our mom and pop shop, our mom and pop shops deserve every benefit that we could possibly give them. That's the model here. Right, no, I, I understand, but the, the, the negatives of that is yeah. that you have trucks that are often driven probably twice as long as they need to be driven to service the same number of customers. Uh, and you also have some inherently very unsafe practices, as we have seen recently with the number of fatalities on the city streets caused by private carters. So, I mean, I think that, yes, you are correct. There's the biggest benefit is actually not to the mom and pops, I'm sorry to say, but really to the big commercial businesses in, in midtown Manhattan where there is that many carters operating. But it, it, it is definitely a trade-off. It's less safe for pedestrians. It's less safe uh, on the streets. It's less safe for the so employees. So government is now going to pay Councilman winners Madrona, and losers. So can you Matthew just close up here? your questioning, yeah. Councilman Madrona? Yeah. Just close it up. So my problem is government picking winners and losers. And we are the freest country in the world, and we're starting to act more like dictatorship than anything else. It is not our position to dictate who should get into what industry. We're supposed to allow an environment of free market to control within guidelines and considering public safety, and it's a concern, and this would be, again, in the back of taxpayers and everyone else, but we'll... we'll I, I really think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when, when we put the... I out. doubt that. When government gets involved, I'm never pleasantly surprised. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Joni. Um, we've been joined by Councilmember Adams and Gibson, uh, and now we have questions from Councilmember Deutsch, followed by... Oh, I'm sorry. We just have a quick... Follow-up question to yeah, just uh, one follow-up. He's a hard act to follow up. Yes. I must admit. Um, we mentioned the uh, organics recycling program in uh, Stives in Town, which is mm -hmm. my favorite place on earth. And uh, I w they're doing it voluntarily, right? As well. Everyone is doing it. Everyone's voluntarily. doing it voluntarily. How do we? Is there a program to get? I mean, we are twenty-five thousand people. It's a huge footprint, and but it's it's a it's an organizable neighborhood. Are there efforts to look at other neighborhoods that are even similar in nature to NYCHA? Even I mean, would be in one example, but other neighborhoods oh. like it to expand it voluntarily. And then, what is the plan so, to do it? So, I mean, it? obviously, the the reason why it's a neighborhood that we could look at is because it's under the same ownership. So that is why we were able to run go through it that way. Um, we are working very hard with management companies across the city and all the high-rise areas to, to really bring on more and more buildings. Um, and we, can, we brought in, I think the last time I was here for preliminary, we had just started our first Bronx high-rise high route where we were working with them. Um, so we are open to people applying in any high-rise to come into the program uh, and be part of that. So we there have any, a we Is there any is there any reason they would? I mean, isn't it? Vol it's voluntary. They have to put a bin downstairs. Is there yeah. any other? Is there any other? And they have to get. And you have to pick it up. Is that? What oh yeah, we pick it up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, the 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 issue is getting you know the management company, the residents, and the porters to all do the right thing and get it to me on the curb. Okay. Um, and so that's why we have them go through a program to apply for it. Uh, and buildings use it who care about sustainability and use it as sort of like part of their promotion of like we're a very sustainable organization to uh, sort of push that as part of their marketing materials, which I'm fine with. Um, 
but anything you think of that we could be doing better in terms of re doing outreach to those sorts of buildings uh, on on NYCHA, uh, we're we're still working very hard on their regular recycling needs. Um, so if they actually came forward and said they really wanted to do it at a specific development, that would be fine. But right now, our focus with NYCHA has been on sort of the more traditional because that really was not happening before I started here. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow with you on that. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, Commissioner. How are you? Great seeing you. So I only have about 40 minutes, so please answer like, you know, as short as, as, short as possible. Not give me 40 minutes, Gary. Don't be jealous. So anyway, um, first I wanted to ask you, uh, you did mention in your testimony that you um, be purchasing another 446 new collection trucks. Yes. Would, um, now these collection trucks are for regular trash or, or in addition, will, will it also include for recycling? Oh, they're, they're, they're both. I mean, and it depends on what district you're in. So we're, we're getting rear loaders and dual bins. Um, in some areas, we use the dual bins for refuse and organics. In some areas, we use that for metal, glass, and plastic and paper. But there are other areas where um, rear loaders pick up only paper in Manhattan. They pick up only paper. So they're, it's flexible. They're not specifically designated for one or the other. OK, I just wanted to bring up that um, the your recycling trucks are double backloaders. Not always, not everywhere. So what is it, double or single? It double or single. Double so or I single. mean, so they. So, so, so yeah. So I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that when it's your recycling day now with the organics, so you put out the trash, yeah. you put out the recycling, mm -hmm. then you put out the organics, and then it get it get it gets picked up by three different trucks, three different times. So you, it's not it's not always picked. it's yeah. not always with two trucks. So no, for your district, and it's different in different places, but in your district, your, um, we use two dual bin trucks on that day. So there are only two trucks coming down your street. So th those two split bodies, one half picks up refuse, the other picks up organics, and the other truck picks up metal, glass, and plastic, and on the other side picks up paper. So on your block, it should only be two trucks on your recycling day. So, so one truck is for regular trash. One truck is for regular okay. trash then and you organics. Have the, then you have the second truck that has the double. No, no, there are two double trucks. There's two double trucks. Two so, double trucks. So one double truck would be for uh, cardboard and. And metal, glass, and plastic. Plastic. And then, you, and then where does the organics go? So one side, the big side is for the refuse, and the small side is for the organics. So you only have two sides. Huh? So, so you mix the cardboard with the plastic? No, no, no. The, there, are two, there are two dual bin trucks in your neighbor, in, on that day. Two trucks, each split in half. So the recycling is getting picked up on each side. Metal, glass, and plastic on one side, paper on the other. Okay. The second truck, one side is refuse, the other side is the organic. So it should be just two trucks on your block. So it's two trucks. Okay, got it. Okay, um, so I just want, I also want to follow up on the previous hearing, um, so I'm not going to get into it now unless I, I stick around for the second round. So I wanted to speak to you about the 12 holidays, uh, those pickups, like as soon as um, the holiday ends, um, the trash should be picked up and in, in addition also the recycling should be picked up uh, right after the holiday. And also I wanted to speak to you about the uh, corner waste baskets in commercial areas to see if we get seven day a week pick up seven days so I mean I, I think that we've talked about this before um, and it was a particularly challenging set of Mondays as well as snowstorms in January where we which isn't usual to have Christmas New Year's Martin Luther King veterans and President's Day all falling on a Monday um, that was a lot I'm a Monday I know it was a lot so we need to take care of your block too Huh? We need to take care of your neighborhood too. No, actually, so the thing that, that you, one of the things that, that I, I just want to, and I, and I understand, we are asking a lot of the public, um, but for the most part, we, we don't get a lot of complaints about a post-holiday collection, because um, we do work really hard to get a lot of it and rotate where we miss. Um, I know that it is inconvenient uh, for people, but it, if I was given the funding to actually fully do that on a Tuesday, I'd actually rather use it, and I would love to work with you about <laughs> thinking through. 
I think I hear more from the public around cleaning issues than I do around post-holiday issues. Um, and so, I mean, it's a balance. We are asking the Monday people who usually take the brunt of it, not all the holidays, but many of the holidays, uh, to be patient. And, you know, I understand that's challenging. It's just, it would be very expensive um, to actually meet that because it's asking me to staff for a peak, um, for 12 peak days, the 12 Tuesdays. Uh, and that's just, you know, it's hard for us to do. We do, um, you know, put anyone we can on overtime on that Tuesday to make sure that we're getting as much as possible, uh, particularly on the refuse side. Uh, but, you know, we, we, unless we added a lot more staff, we would not be able to do it. So I just want to, to know for the record that you don't support uh, picking up the trash 100% after a holiday. Uh, I, uh, you, you're just saying that we're not getting enough complaints and people have to bear with us. I mean, it, it is a it balance is. in which I look at what, where I think the resources of the department would be most effectively used, and I know it's asking Monday people to have more patience than other people, um, but I do think that I would, have, I would have other priorities ahead of this. Okay, so, okay, and secondly, the uh, corner waste baskets in commercial areas so we don't currently have seven days, seven days a week in all commercial areas. You have overflowing baskets throughout the city. Um, and do you support seven-day seven day week pickup? I, I support looking at each area individually. If we have areas where we think that the service is not meeting what the need is, I would certainly look to add service. I mean, I think that I came in and said I, we need Sunday service um, and we need holiday service, that that was a real problem, particularly in commercial areas. Uh, that were going like many hours without service. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say broadly every litter basket needs seven day a week service. Um, but I would definitely be willing to look at uh, specific areas and see whether or not our service is meeting the demands of that area and advocate for the resources to increase basket service. So I just want to say that your office has been very extremely responsive whenever these uh, issues arise. I have to say, very responsive. It could be 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it could be 2 o'clock in the morning, and I, get, I receive a response to my email. Mm -hmm. So your office is very responsive. But I just want to say it shouldn't come to it that um, baskets are overflowing, and I take you around my district, and I guarantee you it's throughout the city, and, and the baskets need to be totally you know, picked up and not overflowing. And I just want to say for the record that collection should be picked up 100%, and that's why I disagree with the commissioner, that it should be picked up 100% after holiday, after snow day. And because the fact is, is that you have 200 sanitation offices who ticket homeowners. So um, if, you, if we're going to hold homeowners accountable for a wrapper in front of his or her home, then we have to set a good example as a city and keep our community 100% clean and have sanitation 100% funded because now we have, number one, 8.6 million New Yorkers. We had previously 8.5. We need to go with the flow of population. And we need to make sure that our streets are completely clean um, because when people see that the streets are um, uh, messy and overflowing baskets, they just tend to throw trash um, you know, if they had something on them, they'll just throw it with the, with the trashes. So we need to set uh, a good example to the city. So, and also with the additional organic pickups, right? We're adding organics. We add, keep on adding stuff. And I support um, our environment, and I think it's a good thing. But if we're going to keep on adding, and not f making sure that sanitation is 100% fully funded. I will continue, especially now during the budget, to have press conferences, to mobilize, and to send a message to the city that we need to fully uh, fund the men and women of the sanitation department and give them the resources that they need to do their job properly. And I could promise you that, that I will be here in front of City Hall, in, now, in my neighborhoods, uh, throughout other communities, to ask the administration to fully, fully fully fund sanitation, not talk about other issues until sanitation is 100% fully funded. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. And, and I just want to, I know that you said 
it wouldn't be your priority, you would prioritize funding um, that could possibly go, let's say if we found it, that could go to a holiday pickup, that you would actually try to move that somewhere to where you think there's a higher priority. Um, but I think what we're hearing from Councilmember Deutsch and from this committee um, is that that is a priority for us. And um, just wanna know the feasibility of that actually being able, being able to be accomplished. Can we get pickup at the same rate, I guess, um, for holiday pickup as traditional, I guess, regular day pickup, I would call it. Um, so, so we just want to know if it can happen. So it is a huge, well, it would take me some time because I would need to hire probably close to 2,500 more sanitation workers. Um, oh, so it's either we, re we double it up or we... It well, because you're talking about two, like, you know, the day after a holiday, I have twice the material. And so I put everybody, besides the, fo the Tuesday people mm -hmm. who are there, we put anybody else who's available on overtime, and we get about 70%. That's usually what we get. Uh, we don't end up getting any of the recycling. Uh, and so those folks need to wait another week. And so if we did it on straight time and didn't do it on overtime, it's, it's a huge number of people. It'd be $100 million. Um, you know, we, so would, would I choose to spend that to make it so that, that, I mean, we'd have a ton of extra people around, so we could probably I guess we were pick trying to our baskets was, four times a day. I agree with you, if we had a hundred million dollars, maybe that's not where we want to put it, but we were hoping that there was a more, uh, a, a more creative way of being able to deal with these 12 holidays or whatever they are, or maybe in, in extreme days, like, uh, you know, so, I mean, Monday. The, the other There's way, two the, Mondays. Maybe we could do it. Every, I mean, if you you could take away all of 831's holidays and make everybody work every holiday. I mean, that's that's I don't think is really acceptable. Like, we do occasionally make them work the holiday. Mm -hmm. um, it is not unusual that we have them work Veterans Day or that we had we had them work Martin Luther King this year. Um, but I try not to do that, you know, because it is. It's a holiday, um, so it's it's just the function of the fact that you're 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 asking. It's it's, um, you know, if you wanted to fund something else where you could only do it in the summertime, uh, I mean, maybe Parks Department works this way, where you're saying I'm going to fund the head count, but literally I only need lifeguards for a few months of the year. We're talking about even less. It's like 12 days, and it's it's just the peaking factor that makes it so expensive. All right, so now I want to just get, we have two more folks that are going to ask questions because we actually have to close this up for the hearing that's waiting to, to start 20 minutes ago. Um, so we want to call on Councilmember Gradenchik followed by Councilmember Adams. Do I get uh, 10 minutes like Mr. Deutsch or just? Oh, Mr. Deutsch is extremely special. I had so 15, no, you get five. be honest. <laughs> good morning, uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Always good to see you. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, the excellent snow removal in Eastern Queens. As always, um, I don't think we got a single complaint, maybe one, but that was from Chaim Joich because he was jealous. Um, just quickly, I know that uh, in your comments you mentioned uh, CB11, CB13 garage. What's the status on that now? Um, so we are looking for swing space, as you know, and trying to work that out, uh, and we are in the midst of procuring design uh, in order to do that construction. Um, you're looking for, maybe, maybe we can talk we, about that? Yeah, we, 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 should, we should continue to discuss what our options might be. All right, I'll throw you a call. Okay. All right, yeah, we need some options. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Adams. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Very nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I wholeheartedly support um, DSNY. Um, those of us in Southeast Queens need you need you, need you. Um, and I wholeheartedly concur with my colleague, Councilmember Deutsch, uh, when he says that um, the need for pickup continues. Uh, I just wonder, are there any areas in New York City where there are seven day pickup? Oh all? yes, no, there's, there's, there is seven day pickup on most commercial areas within the city of New York. It can even be more frequently than that. Um, it really varies by the amount of pedestrian traffic that we see. Uh, and the volumes that we're that we're seeing. So I mean, it's it is it is completely spans the spectrum. Do we have any seven-day pickup in Southeast Queens? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And I guess uh, my final question will be: um, as you are well aware, we do have issues of chronic 
illegal dumping in Southeast Queens. What is the progress of the cleanup of those um, chronic dump out spots? So, I mean, we pick up those pretty, uh, we keep a list of everywhere that we know, um, both uh, to use to stake out and try and catch people, um, but also we will send people out immediately to clean it up. We do not leave where, we, where supervisor sees that we have a dump out situation. We do not let it stay. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner, thank you. I'm, of course, Councilmember Drum. And good to see nice you. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, I was I apologize. I was at a funeral of a dear friend this morning, so oh, that's I'm why sorry. I'm just getting in now. Um, but I just have one question. Actually, I had a number of questions, but I'm just going to answer this one because we are running behind. Um, and it's about the sanitation basket routes. For fiscal 18, council members allocated approximately 2.8 million dollars from the New York City Cleanup Initiative for additional basket services. Each council member, in consultation with your agency, determined the routes and days for pickup for service. Uh, does DSNY evaluate certain routes uh, designated by council members? Now, sometimes I think there's a combination of New York City cleanup and discretionary funds. Like for my routes, um, we do uh, ACE, does the basket um, bagging mm -hmm. and then sweeping, and then I also put in extra funding for um, additional pickups along Roosevelt Avenue, 37th Avenue, and Broadway. Do you evaluate that? Do you look at that? Do you determine how many bags are collected or the effectiveness of these programs? So, I mean, we don't count bags, uh, but they're also, it's not all basket trucks. I mean, because council members really pick and choose from the menu. Uh, I know, for example, that Debbie Rose gets a mechanical broom on Staten Island. Uh, so it, it really does vary. Some council members only buy baskets. They don't actually ever ask us for any service or pay us for any service. Um, but we are looking at our routes and our basket routes and where things are all the time. I mean, in some cases, uh, you know, we'll rework a route uh, to try and make it more efficient in terms of what point in the day does that can get collected. Um, so it is evaluated, but there um, but it's really varied in terms of what, uh, what's, what council members are choosing to use that funding for. Do you know how many council members, aside from the cleanup initiative, give funding to uh, mm -hmm. Department of Sanitation um, for things like additional service on different routes? Hmm? Uh, I can get back specifically, but according to my staff, less than a dozen. Less than a dozen. Okay. All right, that was really about it. Um, I think that we're done because we're falling behind here as well. So, um, uh, Council Mo Member Moya, I hope you were introduced, but if not, you are now <laughs> officially introduced as being here. Uh, and with that, I guess we're going to close out this portion. And thank you, Commissioner, and the Department of Sanitation for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. you.